Hi everyone and welcome to this uh, video about risk management in paragliding. So over winter I've been looking into uh, the work done by the safety committee at the French equivalent of HPAC and I thought maybe this could be of interest to uh, some people in the club as well. Obviously most of what uh, the FFVL, the French Federation, has output is in French so I thought uh, in case it interests someone in the club, I would uh, just try to translate some of the work that was done for everyone to enjoy. So a quick word about myself. Uh, name's Jeremy. I'm an eternal beginner. I'm just here to translate um, the work done by someone else who is actually qualified. So the sources for what I'm going to talk about are going to be mainly uh, things from uh, the FFVL. And this book that was... Uh, written by the chair of the safety committee, this very French-looking Frenchman called Jean-Marc Galland, um, who's been looking into this matter and compiling a lot of data and coming up with a method uh, to try and improve um, risk management in our activity. So why use the data from the FFVL and, and not just simply uh, data from HBAC? It's just um, the difference in numbers, really. And the French Federation has about 30 times, give or take, uh, the number of pilots that HBAC has. So in terms of statistics, the larger the pool of data, obviously, the more reliable uh, the conclusions. Other countries also have quite a few uh, pilots, like uh, the BHPA in Britain and DHV in Germany. Um, but in both cases, most of the flying over there is done in, in flatlands. So uh, the type of flying that is done in France is a lot closer to what we do here in the lower mainland. So let's have a look at the, the data that the FFEL has gathered over the past, uh, give or take, 15 years. Um, there's an average of 500 accidents reports a year. In terms of raw numbers, uh, over the 14 years from 2007 to 2020, there's an average of 10 deaths a year and 130 serious injury, or to put it in a different way relative to uh, the number of pilots in the country, that's uh, one death for 3,000 pilots and one serious injury, 433 licenses. Well, let's have a quick look um, at uh, the type of data that is compiled by um, the FAVL. So, for example, these are... Um the uh, deadly accidents for the year 2021 and uh, so the, the type of data that you can find here are uh, for example um, the wing and its aspect ratio uh, involved in the accident the year of first license uh, for the pilot so that gives us an idea of uh, the pilot's experience here um, the type of uh, license that the pilot had, the our equivalent of P2, P3, etc. And here is a quick description of each of these accidents. And uh, we'll see that later on, but you can notice if you pause and you have a quick look through um, this description or if you uh, follow the link at the bottom of the video um, to see the actual uh, file on the, the FAVL website, you can see that there's quite a few uh, rotations are involved in uh, these accidents. The FFVL mentions the fact that uh, the pilot in this case didn't throw her reserve despite uh, sufficient altitude and here same thing the pilot didn't throw his reserve despite sufficient altitude. So the few things that you can see straight away from the description of those accidents is uh, uh, how common rotation uh, our rotations are involved in these accidents, uh, collapses as well, in this case uh, close to terrain during an attempt to top land. Um, but rotation here again and a rotation here as well. So rotations, collapses and um, the reserve not being thrown are pretty common in, uh, in all these um, uh, accidents. The FAVL also outputs a PDF file for each year about uh, the accidents that happened. So this uh, shows the number of declaration or accident reports, um, the number of accidents with uh, level zero um, 
severity when there is no damage uh, to the gear and absolutely no one got hurt in any way um, there's very few because people usually just don't really report it level one are going to be uh, damage to the gear and um, the pilot or in the case of tandems the pilot and or the passenger uh, will have been hurt but these are still uh, accidents uh, that lead to no more than one day in hospital and uh, no um, life-changing uh, injuries. Level 2 are um, accidents that lead to at least two days in hospital and or life-changing injuries and deaths are self-explanatory. Uh, the numbers over the last 11 years are pretty consistent so that's something worth noting. Uh, they give also the numbers of uh, accidents and severity of accidents for what they call professional settings. So these are in accidents uh, in school or professional tandems. And here, uh, the same thing for leisure pilots. Um, something worth noting um, are the fact that during uh, professional tandems and school uh, settings, uh, the accidents mostly take place during uh, the landing phase or the launching phase here respectively 45 or 40 and 45 percent I, I don't think you can read properly so you've got to take my word for it and the accidents um, during flights only represent about nine eight percent of the accident although despite representing a very small proportion of accident out of the three deadly accidents that happened between the year 2018 to 2021 out of those three um, deadly accident two of them took place uh, originated more like during um, a flying phase here is uh, here are the numbers for um, the laser flying and in this case um, the accident take place a lot more during the flying part uh, because and now it's about 33 percent so about a third of the accidents actually uh, happen during the flying phase rather than uh, uh, the takeoff or the landing and again despite representing uh, about a third of the total of accidents uh, they still represent a huge majority of the deadly accidents um, as in 8 out of a total of 9, 13 out of a total of 17, these are for different years, uh, 7 out of a uh, total of 9, 7 out of a total of 10, despite again representing only one third of the total of accidents. So we see that the accidents in, during the flying um, are fewer but uh, a lot more serious. Uh, this is another way that they present their data and honestly is I'm gonna skip on this This is really complicated to explain and um, These are a quick description of uh, every single uh, deadly accident during the year 2021 and um, What you can notice here again is the notion of a turn that leads to the impact an autorotation an autorotation um, and this is a um, speed wing, so that's a little bit different here. Here is a rotation as well. Here is a rotation. Here is a rotation. Here is a rotation. Uh, collapse close to terrain. This is a collapse during uh, the final approach. A spin uh, followed by a cascade leading to a rotation. And uh, finally, um, a stall and a surge an uncontrolled surge leading to impact uh, during the landing phase. So this is another way of visualizing uh, uh, the data from the FFVL. So out of about a million flights a year, obviously there's an estimate here. They also estimate that there will be about 100,000 critical situations. So that is going to be a movement of the wing that is not due to a pilot input, for example. An incident can develop in about 10% of those cases so this will be um, uh, a full frontal or a, a, a significant collapse and a significant um, incident uh, during the flight um, they estimate that about a, th a thousand uh, accidents happen in a year so it's going to be tree lending or 
something that results in an injury or damage uh, to the pilot and then uh, injuries and deaths are self-explanatory. Uh, what they're really keen on insisting uh, for people to understand is that there are no, these are not different types of events um, that lead to an incident. They all come from the same type of, uh, of event. So a surge forward could just be a critical situation if it stops there. But if it's not controlled by the pilot, it can lead to a proper uh, collapse, which would be an incident. And if it's still not controlled or the conditions are very turbulent or whatever, it, this can lead to a fully fledged spiral. And that is an, ex an accident. The accident that uh, lead to serious injury, injuries or worse are just, again, all coming down from what could be at the very beginning, a simple surge. And this was discussed by Bruce Goldsmith in a short article for XCMAG a few years ago about um, being mindful of um, collapses or frontals because even if these are part of flying, these are incidents that happen um, all the time, any time, these are the same events that can lead to serious accidents. So here's a comparison between um, the average pilot and the average pilot uh, involved in a deadly accident. And you'll see that there's about a 10 years difference in the average age. Um, men tend to be overrepresented uh, in the deadly accidents. And you see here that there's um, something interesting with the, um, the average pilot who uh, has a deadly accident. Uh, they are more experienced uh, have about double the average air time a year and and they fly way more advanced wings on average uh, than the average pilot. Um, there could be different explanations for this, obviously. The more you fly, the more you expose yourself to uh, an accident. That seems obvious. But at the same time, uh, when you fly an ENC and an ND and you fly 90 hours a year for... Uh, over eight years, you should also have uh, some serious skills. So there's both an explanation and a question mark also. We'll see we, if we can try and, and get closer to an answer later on. And a quick word about reserves. Um, so those 14, over the 14 years between 2007 and 2020, um, 141 uh, deadly accidents, so that's the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the 10, 10 a year average, and in one third of these accidents, um, the pilot could have thrown uh, their reserves. Um, obviously, it's impossible to know what would have been the outcome had they thrown uh, their reserves. But another number is interesting to put um, next to it is over the same period of time, over 1,100 uh, reserves were thrown. And that is outside of uh, SIV training or anything like that. These are like... Uh, reserve throwing in case of emergency um, and one pilot died after successfully deploying their reserve and that was mentioned by Greg Hamilton on his uh, YouTube channel recently but according to a study by the FFEL over 90% of pilots don't throw the reserve when they should during a collapse that leads to an accident practice reserve deployments at home so you're mentally prepared to do it you can tie the inner bag shut during simulations. So why didn't these pilots throw their reserves uh, during the accidents? Well, there could be obviously uh, plenty of explanations. Uh, so to try and answer these questions uh, and all the others that we've been thinking about so far, the author of the book uh, and chair of the safety commission at the FFVL used a risk causality uh, method called the reasons model, also known as Swiss cheese model. This is an analytics method that is used also in um, aeronautics and and um, healthcare, etc., to try and understand uh, what uh, what led to an accident and why wasn't the accident stopped on the way so the concept is uh, fairly simple uh, we've got a series of uh, what you call protective plates each of these plates are essentially a skill or a parameter whether piloting skills 
uh, weather conditions and knowledge about meteorology, mental condition, gear, uh, community and progression, physical condition obviously, and knowledge about accidentology. And each of these skills or parameters have gaps. We all have, have gaps in uh, our skills and knowledge. And those plates are assumed to move as well. So it's not always uh, the same situation at every flight, at every minute of each flight, etc. And the idea is that an accident is the result of an accumulation of lacks in knowledge or skills. So what the author uh, of the book offers to do is to try and look into each and every one of these protective plates and identify our lacks of skills and knowledge for each of uh, these topics. And so this is what we are going to do uh, and talk about each and every one of these um, of these subjects. Uh, some of them I'm gonna go through very quickly, some of them that I'm gonna look into a little bit more in depth. And um, let's start directly with piloting skills. I'm not gonna get into much detail in this uh, particular protective plate because this is one of the topics that we talk about the most between us anyway and we think about the most. So SIV would be obviously uh, a good way to increase our piloting skills, whether to control and uh, well, hopefully avoid um, unfortunate events that can lead to the accidents as we've seen uh, uh, just before, um, and general control of, uh, of our wings, uh, and very importantly also the control of rotations and what they call auto rotations, uh, as we've seen that they are very often involved in serious accidents. So here's an example of an issue uh, with a lack of control of uh, the rotation. So this is obviously an SIV. Um, the pilot has made a mistake during the first maneuver and find himself finds himself in this rotation. Um, the instructor tells him to get back in straight controlled flight but um, the pilot is going to be more focused on trying to reopen his collapsed wing rather than control the direction of, um, of his wing. And you can see here how, um, uh, how much uh, the pilot is leaning into the collapsed side because he's uh, trying to reach for lines uh, in the collapse sign. So the instructor is telling him to stop the rotation, stop the rotation, but the pilot's trying to reopen uh, ends up pulling some brakes, etc. And because the rotation was not controlled, um, as soon as the pilot starts pulling on any of the lines, the rotation accelerates instantly and then uh, it goes into uh, first. It's interesting as well because you see the difference between a rotation, a spiral, and this is an auto rotation. Um, and this is completely gone out of control. Uh, luckily, the pilot is. Uh, was descending at a fairly reasonable uh, descent rate, so there was no hurt whatsoever in the end. Same way, kiting is obviously another skill that we need to develop in order to um, be a lot more relaxed uh, during the launches and the general control of the wing. Another thing that Ray Hamilton also showed in one of the videos back when he was still with Fly Bobble was trying to work on our stall, stall point sorry, um, on the hill. Uh, this is one of the many uh, skills that we can get through kiting. And the author of the book also suggests that uh, practicing a little bit of acro um, could be also a good practice for uh, wing control. Uh, I think I remember uh, uh, Jockey Sanderson mentioning that uh, he thinks he can uh, estimate the level of a, of a pilot in terms of piloting skills just by looking at the way the pilot performs wing overs. So these are just a few ways to uh, improve our piloting skills. Um, I'm gonna move on to meteorology very quickly. Another subject that I'm gonna uh, mention almost in passing because we uh, we already know quite a lot about that and it being the end of uh, winter I'm sure we've all been uh, reading through meteorology books. Seasons obviously we're going into spring right now uh, there's a lot of uh, temperature contrast which uh, will lead to some serious instability. Being able to read a uh, forecast it doesn't seem like it would be um, a cause of risk but we'll see later on that uh, if you have blocked a day to go and fly because you've misread 
uh, the forecast, uh, you might be tempted to uh, go and and launch, even though in normal times you wouldn't fly in uh, these conditions. Uh, small scale uh, meteorology, so the orographic dangers, these are much more direct risks, whether venturi, turbulences uh, due to the terrain or uh, turbulences um, due to um, thermal activity, obviously. Wind shears, gradients, this is all like uh, part of a vocabulary that I suppose all pilots know or should know. And also we should pay attention to the evolution of the conditions after we've launched, obviously, from overdevelopment, uh, noticing a coming gust front or winds picking up in valley. These are all phenomena that we know about, uh, but this is basically all I'm going to say about this particular plate. So let's talk about the mental condition now um, and let's start with fear or fears even, fear and stress. So there are many types of fear um, when we fly from the fear of being too high to being too low, too close to terrain, or being alone in the sky or the fear of having too many people around us too close, the fear of turbulence, of gear failure. Uh, fear of cloud suck. Um, Counterintuitively, a certain level of stress is beneficial uh, as was uh, proven by the psychologists um, Yeeks and Dotson uh, about a hundred years ago when they um, proved that there's a positive um, improvement of uh, performance uh, with the stress level up to a certain amount. So uh, what they mean is that there's an optimal level of stress when doing an activity that leads to a heightened focus somewhere between what they identify as attention and vigilance. If the stress level comes down too far, then we start performing less well because we're just bored or uh, or starting to fall asleep even. Uh, and obviously if the stress level uh, rises too far, then we slide down into anxiety or further. Um, this optimal uh, level of stress is uh, also what uh, many people refer to as a flow state. Uh, so what tools do we have to deal with stress? Um, so verbalizing is uh, one that I personally use a lot. It uh, really helps to uh, calm down, uh, describing what happens, rationalize the situation uh, quite well. Uh, breathing techniques like yoga techniques uh, or, or meditation um, obviously uh, helps um, bringing down our um, pulse and um, adrenaline levels. Uh, flying in group can help as well obviously uh, if uh, you uh, have a fear of being close to each other to a certain extent uh, let's not fly too close but uh, not feeling alone uh, helps uh, rationalizing again uh, what's happening around us when we see that other people are flying it means that it's it can't be as scary as it may seem to us uh, at this very second uh, setting oneself's goals uh, so short goals basically um, if uh, you start to feel uh, fear or stress rising a little bit too high then just set yourself a goal for the coming 10 minutes so try to get high if you're uh, worried about being too close to terrain or uh, try to look forward to uh, the next uh, transition that you're gonna that you're going to attempt decide to uh, stay for another 20 minutes before going to land any sort of short-term goal uh, takes your mind away from the irrational fear that you might be feeling at that moment drinking water uh, is something that i do also very regularly um, as soon as i've had um, an incident or uh, i've been through a strong thermal i will take the time to have uh, a little sip of water uh, that helps me uh, uh, calm myself down and obviously increasing um, uh, our practice uh, helps uh, uh, feeling a lot less stress. So if the stress level goes beyond uh, anxiety and starts to go into panic, what happens is that you've got uh, high levels of adrenaline um, flooding in and uh, some of the reactions are going to be, so first cognitive reactions, so some people turn into apathy or sideration and just stop reacting altogether, or, and some others um, will start turning in, uh, hyperactive, and that's what we see in some videos with um, the arms flailing around and preventing the wing from flying. Um, there will be some uh, physical reactions, so tunnel vision is one of them. 
these reactions are basically uh, the result of a um, fight or flight uh, state, where in this case, more flight than anything else. So the tunnel vision um, is because uh, when you run away from an animal trying to kill you, you don't need to see what's around you. Uh, and that's how we end up seeing um, uh, videos of, uh, of uh, pilots being really low above a uh, village, for example, and uh, set on landing on a road um, and not uh, and not choosing to land on um, what seems like landing fields that are just uh, outside uh, their path. Uh, there might be a loss of sensibilities and extremities uh, which uh, will lead us to not feel uh, that we're about to uh, stall the wing and uh, blood flow changes as well. Large muscles of the body such as the glutes and the legs and the thighs uh, are going to receive more blood and more oxygen uh, the same way that is to prepare us for uh, running away from danger but in terms of uh, paragliding the problem is that it it straightens our legs uh, where uh, we would need really to tuck our um, legs under our bums which puts us at danger of twisting uh, for example uh, so what to do in cases of extreme stress well the problem is that all the methods that we've been talking about before are kind of obsolete at this stage. This is not the moment uh, breathing techniques or, or verbalizing is going to help much. Really, we need to prepare for these situations uh, before. So, for example, um, SIV is going to be a simulation of these incidents. So the idea is that uh, if we do find ourselves in uh, some uh, high G spiral, uh, we will have already worked on this. So there's a chance that our brain can remind itself of what to do. Uh, practice throwing the reserve uh, when we do a repack instead of just extracting the, the reserve from its pod. Uh, and putting it on the table and starting to uh, unfold it. It could be an idea to hang the harness and throw it a little bit like we saw in the Greg, uh, Greg Hamilton video before. Um, the same way, uh, um, Theo de Blick, uh, I remember in one of the videos, he was explaining that between uh, launch and uh, reaching the box, he practices at every flight, uh, grabbing and pretending to throw the reserve so that when there is an actual issue, he doesn't have to think about where is uh, this handle. He he knows already, he's got muscle memory of how to get to the handle. So uh, there's a lot less fumbling around uh, when it's needed. Uh, the same way of hanging the harness and practicing uh, the counterweight shift. Piloting uh, with the back risers can be a good idea as well. If an incident happens while we're having a, uh, a bit of water or taking a picture and we're not uh, holding the, the brake handles, uh, for me, I find that a lot easier to go and reach for the back risers rather than trying to grab the, the brake handles. Also, brake lines do break. And uh, and last thing is visualizing, or what this is called also mental rehearsal. So you see Olympic divers do that uh, when they will be on the ground uh, before their turn comes. And they will practice uh, the maneuvers with their arms or, or whatever. And uh, apparently that triggers exactly the same zones in the brain as actually performing. Uh, the actions. So this can be something that we do when we're home, uh, just uh, sitting on the couch, closing our eyes, pretending to be in a, um, in a flying position, and then imagining that we get a massive collapse and uh, pretending to uh, do the weight shift, imagining pulling the brakes gently, imagining what can happen after that. Attention is really important as well uh, during our flight. Uh, a couple of cases uh, that are quite common, which is uh, which are finishing a flight uh, before it's uh, it's over. So the book mentions a case of a competitor who um, who goes for landing uh, before the task is over, um, and uh, just before landing finds a bubble uh, and hopes to get in the bubble in order to get some height back and get back in the task. But unfortunately, the pilot already had switched to landing mode and so made a couple of mistakes in the thermal that uh, ended up with him in a tree somewhat hurt uh, and of his own admission it's because uh, his mind was already not uh, in flying mode anymore he in his mind he was already thinking about uh, tomorrow uh, the next task another situation that can be caused by a lack of attention would be uh, a pilot who's really stressed uh, when launching a pilot who uh, who's not uh, confident 
uh, with their launch. And so they will be extremely stressed uh, before and during um, the takeoff. And as soon as the launch is successful and they're airborne, their stress level uh, would collapse just for a, a short moment. But for a short moment, they're relieved from having managed to launch and their attention goes away while still being close to terrain. And that's an accident that we can find in the data from the FAVL quite often, uh, someone launching and, uh, and then turning into the terrain straight away. So that's another issue with uh, attention because it goes away a little too early. So how to manage uh, our attention when we're flying? So this is an important skill, uh, according to the author, to knowing to when to um, lower and raise back up our attention. Uh, we can't have a full on attention to what we're doing all the time. So at times we've got to learn to lower our attention and how to raise it back. Solving gear issues on the ground so that we don't have to uh, fight against a bar because we can't reach it or anything like that. Uh, these issues should be sorted before uh, it takes our attention away from uh, the actual flying. Uh, staying hydrated and, um, and eating as well so that we can feed our brain which needs uh, water and salt and sugar uh, to keep on performing otherwise we just get really tired really quickly. Uh, distractions outside of our flying life are going to take our at attention away from flying. And the author also suggests to uh, uh, to do other activities or sports that um, make you manage your attention, such, ha such as uh, tennis or golf. A tennis player will have to be extremely focused whilst playing between each point when they have a game that lasts for hours. Um, they've got to, and they most definitely learn, how to let their attention drop and then raise straight away for, uh, in order to be ready for the next point. So homeostasis of risk. Uh, the author gives an example of um, a study made in Norway. Uh, truck drivers uh, have to drive a little bit like here in winter over uh, icy road, etc. So in order to improve uh, and limit uh, the number of accidents, uh, this study uh, basically took two groups of truck drivers, took one to very intense and uh, special training to learn how to deal with these extreme conditions. And the witness group obviously didn't go through any training whatsoever. And then a few years later, the researchers looked at uh, the amount of accidents um, to see if the training was efficient and they realized to their great surprise that uh, these two groups had about the same amount of accidents. The truck drivers that had uh, received the, uh, the intense extra training just felt more confident driving over these icy roads and they just simply drove faster leading to more accidents. So this is a sort of drawing that illustrates this concept. Um, we've got a perceived level of risk here and this is uh, the risk level, the perceived risk level that we are comfortable at. So it makes perfect sense that if, if we find ourselves here and it feels like we are taking way too much risk, that we will act towards uh, going back to an acceptable level of risk. So if we're too close to terrain, too close to someone in a thermal, etc., we're going to get away from the terrain or the other pilots. That makes sense. What is more interesting is that if we come down and uh, the perceived level of risk is too low, we feel bored and we will take action in order to get back to a level of perceived risk where we feel comfortable and engaged. So let's talk about uh, the protective plate named gear. Um, I think the main two points uh, when it comes to gear is how to choose it and how to maintain it. So how to choose it is quite important, obviously, to understand the results of uh, the certification test, um, obviously, uh, in order to choose the, the right wing, let's say, uh, for our level and needs. Um, also, it's important to understand the limitation of tests. So one thing to keep in mind, for example, is that those tests are run with an open harness. If a pilot flies with a pod harness, the results of those tests would probably be quite different. Um, the test pilots make sure that they stay neutral in the harness 
uh, during the collapses, for example, they don't pull brakes either. If we start over piloting, that would probably completely change the results as well. The way passive safety is tested on harnesses is just a, a vertical drop of a meter 65. The testing company would just check uh, the impact of a, of a square of 25 centimeter by 25 centimeter and that it never goes above uh, 50 G's acceleration. Um, and that's it. And there is no test for protection for the back or the sides, for example. Um, knowing also that um, uh, inflatable airbags usually have better protection uh, for a vertical drop than a foam or the new system with the choroid. Um, but in an, uh, a sort of a sideways impact, uh, the air tends to be um, moved away uh, from uh, the impact. Uh, and so the protection can be a lot lowered. As for uh, the maintenance, obviously uh, keeping your wing in trim is quite important. Uh, the lines shrink and it's important to check that the lines uh, at the back, like the C lines, haven't uh, shrunk more than uh, the, the A lines. Otherwise, uh, the stalling point might have changed. It's important to check that the brake lines still have slack even uh, when fully accelerated, otherwise that might be a problem also to exit um, deep stalls or other situations like this. Making sure that the harness protector is in a good condition. I heard the testimony of, a, of the owner of a repair shop in France who said that he checked some uh, harnesses with airbag protectors that were damaged, so even if the the, the airbag looked like it was inflated. In reality, if there was any sort of impact on it, the air would be expelled and uh, there was hardly any protection at all. Choosing the reserve uh, at the right size and more importantly, repacking it regularly. Uh, when it comes to helmets, um, knowing the difference between a skiing helmet and a paragliding helmet, the way they're tested, uh, the sort of impact they have to go through during testing uh, is important. Uh, to uh, make the right choice. There are, no, there are no bad or wrong choices and good choices. Um, I, I don't believe that's my personal opinion. It's just a matter of knowing what the parameters are so as to make the right choice for yourself and having uh, everything set up uh, properly and comfortably so as not to take away uh, attention from uh, the uh, actual flying. So let's talk about community and progression. In terms of progression, uh, what's important is make sure that we know what our goals are uh, for when it comes to flying. So whether we would just want to boat around, launch at Woodside or go cross country or do a little bit of acro, for example, it's important to have to be aware and honest about um, the time and energy we need to spend on the activity to reach these goals. Um, we need to be our own ground school, obviously, whether reading books about meteorology or any of the many books that, are, uh, that exist around. Another thing that seems quite common in France uh, is uh, pilots will go back to uh, flying schools uh, during their progression to attend clinics, whether SIV, obviously, but also XC clinics or all sorts of um, piloting skills, etc. Competitions are uh, famously a good way to um, make progress. Uh, I've had my first one last year and I've certainly learned a lot about uh, myself and uh, the skills that I need to improve. Um, <clears throat> feedback on experience, or as the French uh, put it, uh, return on experience, which uh, comes as Rex, which sounds pretty cool. Um, so it starts obviously through reports of incidents and uh, accidents. We all learn from um, each other's experience uh, through a uh, forum like uh, that of um, of the club or paragliding forum or any of these online forums. Uh, club meetings, so that's something as well that exists in France. So some clubs will meet, uh, say, uh, every other month or something like that, and they will have what they call um, a confession evening. Pilots will volunteer and come up to uh, um, tell about uh, an, an incident they had and that they found interesting for others to learn about, um, or obviously of positive experience, this is another thing, but um, people will uh, meet and talk about their experience and share that together so that we everybody can vicariously learn about each other's experience. Um, there are some books such as this one, which is basically 
just uh, a feedback book. So talking about the physical condition of the pilot, um, obviously not being tired, not being under the influence, not being ill, uh, etc. Um, injuries can get on the way of uh, proper piloting as well. If we've got pain in the shoulders or the elbows, the hands, obviously, uh, that can be a problem. The fitness um, will let us fly longer and uh, f um, without feeling tired. Hypoxia is a phenomenon that we should all be aware of uh, when we go and fly in places like Pemberton or Golden. Unlikely uh, in uh, in Woodside, otherwise you're probably breaking uh, airspace. But still, um, knowing about it, knowing how to recognize the symptoms and what to do about it, uh, quite crucial in some situations. Feeling cold and cold hands take your attention away from uh, flying and um, lower your sensitivities in your hands can be a problem when it comes to um, uh, flirting with the stalling speed as well. And finally, um, if you need a, a Wii when you're in the air, it might be a problem if it's urgent and you're uh, preparing your approach. You might try to uh, cut some corners. That might be a problem. Uh, it might simply take your attention away from uh, your flying, from your piloting, uh, which is another issue uh, that we talked about very quickly before. And also that might lead you to reduce the amount of water that you drink during the flight and ending up uh, flying somewhat dehydrated, which again can have an influence on your ability to uh, think and analyze uh, the situation. So finally, let's talk about accidentology, starting with what the French call uh, return to the slope or turn into the slope, uh, which is basically right after a pilot launches, um, there's a certain turn that leads the pilot to hit uh, to impact the ground uh, very quickly after that, whether it's uh, an asymmetric collapse that uh, makes the, the wing turn into the slope or um, a problem with the brake lines or some knots in the line. The pilot tries to launch and the pilot and the sorry, the um, commands are in the wrong hand. So he gets confused. Um, gets dragged a little bit and tries to get up while his friend is resetting the wing but because it's windy and gusty uh, he gets picked up uh, without being quite ready without having fixed uh, the brake lines either so uh, despite uh, his best effort or worst effort depending uh, ends up hitting the slope uh, the return to the slope uh, spiraling all the way to the ground that's an example of a spiral that goes all the way down because the pilot will say afterwards uh, that uh, even though he's uh, pulling on the brakes, he didn't realize uh, how much stronger you have to pull um, in, a, in a fully developed spiral. The forces are a lot stronger than usual flight. So, uh, and the lack of um, uh, weight shift doesn't help exi exiting the, the spiral. So it goes all the way to the water, uh, luckily the um, reserve is thrown and opens at the very, very last second. An issue during the pre-flight uh, and uh, the pilot can find themselves not uh, clipped in properly, especially with those uh, uh, pod harnesses that we have, which sometimes have um, a flight deck that gets on top of our leg straps and sometimes we don't realize we're not clipped in properly. Another case is drowning, so that's simply landing in water, which is extremely dangerous in our activity. Um, falling down a tree is uh, is something that happens occasionally. Um, simply uh, pilot landing in a tree um, doesn't have a way to communicate where they are or simply gets impatient or just looks down and think, I'm just five meters off the ground. Surely I can get down from here without having to wait. And, um, and they fall down uh, badly. So being blown into the lee, uh, that's because the wind uh, either uh, have, has picked up or the pilot took off in, uh, in, in conditions that were too strong and uh, is pushed uh, downwind from the launch into the rotor area. Tempting to do wing overs uh, when the technique is not really good. Uh, wing overs are uh, a very difficult technique to, um, to master. You can get collapses during this very dynamic maneuver that can lead to some serious accidents. Uh, auto rotation, as we saw before, um, is a type of rotation that is kind of treacherous because uh, the way to counter it is 
kind of weirdly to uh, shift your weight towards the ground and unlike a spiral so uh, people can get confused by that stalling during final leg uh, that was one of the uh, deadly accidents in the in the list of uh, of the ffvl at the beginning of this video um just uh, self-explanatory as well uh, coming into land and during the final leg um, the stall is done too early and the, and the pilot falls backwards remember that for um, harnesses there is no uh, test for protection for the back so whether there is one or not in the harness that i'm currently using there is absolutely no protection for the back so that is something to consider colliding with power lines or any sort of line um, this is a um, also a, a recurring accident uh, there's a there's a line in annecy uh, that is marked and needs to be known about it's over the back from the main launch and uh, it's taken the lives of i think two pilots already and it's still there so this is something that is um, quite dangerous especially when we come into land uh, in a place after an xc we don't it's not an, an official lz and we haven't realized that there are power lines or or telephone lines or something and uh, these collisions uh, can happen uh, downwind spin so this is in the case of uh, quite often in uh, rich soaring so this is an example of a downwind spin so uh, the pilots are uh, rich soaring and uh, when the the other pilots under the, the uh, what I assume is a delta turns into the slope uh, he gets pushed toward the ground and surprise tries to turn really really hard ends up spinning the wing the wing and then obviously goes into the tree collision between two pilots um, or wings uh, this is something that happens less often than one might suspect this is one of the famous collision videos everybody's uh, thermaling um, in the same uh, in the same lift and uh, there's just some confusion as to who goes where when and uh, despite the fact that they I think both seen each other uh, the inevitable happens uh, they obviously will both come down on the reserve and uh, everything is fine in the end. Dust Devil, um, another type of uh, event that is probably good to uh, be able to recognize the first signs and how to react to them and never hesitate to signal very loud to everyone if you recognize that one seems to be coming. Uh, here's one of the famous videos. of the piloting so we've all seen these videos of um, the pilot not letting the wing fly so in this case uh, we can get back to uh, the matter of um, uh, mental condition when we're talking about um, uh, the effect of extreme stress be hyperactive and that would be a case of uh, of over piloting and also um, lacking the piloting skill of knowing how to do a proper hands up uh, that's another part and that is part of the piloting skills and finally not throwing the reserve uh, which as we've seen before uh, happens quite a lot there could be mental blockages um, not accepting that the situation is out of control over trusting our own skills or there might be a gear issue that should have been sorted before or not enough practice of grabbing the handle so it's important to be ready to throw the reserve mentally physically if it's needed so here we are, we've spoken about uh, every single of these um, protective plates and now what to do about it? And uh, that's essentially uh, the final point of uh, the book. He offers to just write what he calls personal risk management strategy, uh, which is basically every single one of these plates. And uh, he says, for example, uh, every year at the beginning of the season, trying to find um, or think about what skills and knowledge we need to improve on uh, for the year or every two years or whatever. Uh, so that's uh, the method. Here's just an example of what I've written for this year. We'll see how far I go through all these. Some of these are pretty easy. Some of these are quite ambitious, let's say. And uh, yeah, that's that. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you find some things interesting in there. A few things to conclude with. 
the book that most of this was based on is going to have a new version next year and the author told me there's a good chance that it might receive a, a translation into English if you want to hear all of this from the horse's mouth. Obviously everything is much more in depth in the book. Uh, there's a lot of things that I skipped on so as to not make this even longer than it already was. There's a bit about cognitive biases, which is uh, really interesting in terms of uh, the mistake that we can make occasionally that I didn't talk about. And I want to conclude with a very last point. It may seem a little bit grim to talk about risk and accidents, etc. But I think it's really part of the progression of a pilot. If I remember correctly, there's about 12 or 15 percent uh, French pilots who just quit flying every year. So some of them obviously uh, will stop for family reasons or professional reasons or whatnot. But obviously there will be a chunk of that number that will stop flying because they will have scared themselves away from the sport or they will have hurt themselves so bad that they think I cannot possibly continue flying. And obviously nothing can get more in the way of our progression as a pilot than just uh, ending up stopping flying. So I think uh, managing our risk so as to not scare ourselves or hurt ourselves uh, so bad that we stop flying is probably quite crucial in terms of progression. With that said, uh, thanks again for watching this video and I'll uh, see you on the hill very soon.